good morning. How y'all doing today? Awesome. Glad to hear it. Well, I'll uh, never forget May 19th, 1999. It was a date my friends and I were looking forward to. It was the day that the premiere of Star Wars The Phantom Menace was going to show up at movie theaters all over the country. I grew up watching the original trilogy of Star Wars movies. They are still the best. Um, and uh, so, you know, we were, you know, excited for this, this new run of films. But at that same time, uh, I was starting to be introduced to the Christian faith. Uh, my, one of my friends named Dan had, had brought me to uh, the church that would become my home church uh, as a freshman in high school. Uh, and then I became friends with some other folks that were a part of that youth group uh, that also were fellow musicians. And one of my friends' names was Noah. And Noah's mom was really, really into speculating about the end times. And as a new person to the faith, I would be hanging around Noah and therefore be within earshot of Noah's mom sometimes in conversation with her. And she would tell me all about the, the coming millennium and the tribulation and the rapture. And for me, I started to get a little nervous and worried and, and scared. I was a little worried and scared that Jesus was going to come back before I could see Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. Didn't see that coming, did you? And while I say that definitely to get a laugh, it was the absolute truth. And it wasn't just a frivolous movie. It was all the other things that I wanted to experience and look forward to in life. You know, I'm a freshman in high school. You know, I want to finish out my high school years. Maybe I go to college. Maybe meet a nice girl someday, get married, grow up, have a kid. You know, all the things that, you know, everyone... I was like, if Jesus comes back and all this stuff goes down and all of a sudden, you know, everyone gets taken up and their clothes get left everywhere and all the different stuff, you know, none of that's going to unfold. And the first domino to fall will be, I won't see the Phantom Menace. Now, the reason that that's funny also is because the book that we're about to start studying here is the book of Revelation. And it is a book that the moment that I tell anyone we're going to go through the book of Revelation, somebody, everybody, might have an op opinion about it. They might have some really strong feelings about the theological background that they carry into the discussion of this book. Some of them may have a bit of trepidation because they're like, what is he going to get up there and say about this? And am I going to agree with it? <laughs> That's a smile because I'm about to have fun. But uh, it's, it's one of those books that has just been daunting. Uh, and because it is so interpretation heavy, so interpretation dependent, that people have all sorts of opinions on it. And people are afraid to even talk about the book, let alone preach on it or teach on it. And it was that way for me when I first, you know, learned of this book and what was in it. And as a young person of faith, you know, after getting through seeing The Phantom Menace, but still, <laughs> still getting on and learning about the faith anew as a, as a young person, I, I started reading and, and watching different things. And I, I oftentimes think, thank God that YouTube wasn't around by the time I was in high school, because who knows what kind of rabbit trails I would have gone on. But I'll tell you one thing that got really popular at the time when I was young. Any of, ever, any of you ever read the Left Behind books before? Anybody? Or maybe seen the movie with Kirk Cameron in it? Yeah. I remember that. I watched that movie. I read a couple of the books. Again, got a little frightened, like, is this stuff going to happen? Do I need to be looking over my back? What's going on? 
And then as I grew in the faith and I, I got into pastoral work and things like that, I, I met people with all sorts of different uh, opinions about Revelation. I even remember at my, my previous church in Cincinnati at, at Mount Carmel, uh, we had uh, teachers in the church that would, would lead Bible studies and they always wanted to teach Revelation. I had this one lady that uh, I love, but she had, uh, she had what she called her war room in her basement. And it was her whole map of the timeline of everything that was going to unfold based on the book of Revelation and other things. So this is just one of those books that causes people to somewhat squirm a little bit. My hope is that in the next six weeks, counting today, that as we survey this book and we hit some of the highlights, that we'll walk away with an appreciation of the message of the book of Revelation. Because the reality is is that the message of the book of Revelation should cause us trepidation, but probably not for the reasons that you've heard or would think. It should cause us trepidation because we come face to face with the reality that Jesus is Lord and Messiah that he is the Alpha and the Omega, that he is the one who was, is, and is to come, that he is powerful and in dominion over all, for all of time. And that message should call us back to him, should prompt us to put our hope in him and in no other. And it is in this book where we experience the number seven and the dragons and the thrones and the creatures with multiple eyes and heads and all sorts of things that the core message of the power and the dominion of Jesus comes through. And so I hope that as you follow along in the series, and maybe you'll even take time during this series to read through Revelation, you know, beginning at chapter 1 all the way through, that you'll follow along and that you will grasp the core message of this book and that you'll be reoriented around the context of the book. Because one of the reasons that we get wrapped up and twisted in knots over this book is because we lose the plot. We lose the plot, and not only that, we lose the context. And so today, as we look at chapter 1, and we're going to go through the entire chapter 1, I hope that we will be re, uh, resituated, and, and, and if you haven't read through this book, that you will be situated from the first uh, to the context of this book and why we have it in our New Testament. And so what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to read through sections of chapter 1, And I will stop and elaborate, and I will tell you, I'm going to have fun getting into the weeds a little bit. So hopefully, you follow. And if you don't, by the way, you can always ask me questions after service. Knock on my door, throw a shoe at me, it'll get my attention. Whatever. I love to talk. So uh, we're going to jump in, uh, starting at verse 1. And I'll go through verse 3 here. But it says, Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Who is John? Well, John is the apostle of Jesus, whom we believe wrote the Gospel of John, and whom we believe wrote the first, second, and third letters of John. And it is in the book of Revelation that we have the only moment of actual identification of John as the author. 
Though tradition and the, the apostolic fathers and, and the people that wrote about Scripture after the Scriptures were already written uh, believed John to be the author of the fourth gospel and the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John never says his name in any of those passages, but he does here. He's identified here. And there are commonalities between what is said about Jesus and the way that it's said in the book of Revelation that tie back to things that are said about Jesus in the gospel and in those letters of John uh, that make us pretty confident that we've got the same John in mind here. But notice here that the revelation is not John's revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus or from Jesus to be more precise. He is delivering the message that Jesus intends for the churches, as we'll see in a moment, to hear. And we're told that Jesus makes known this message by sending his angel. Uh, the word in Greek for angel is simply the word that means messenger. And so we might not always want to be thinking about a person with wings, it might be, but it could also just be a messenger that is being sent to John with this message, and that will come into play when we get to the seven churches. And then he says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So I'm, I'm glad I get to fit in on this since I'm reading it. I'm blessed now. <laughs> oh, but also, and to those uh, who hear, you're hearing now. Awesome. And it says, and who keep it, or and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I want to stop here for just a moment. I know we've only got three verses in. This is the core reason that this book is in our New Testament. That you hear the words of the prophecy, the proclamation, the message about Jesus and from Jesus, and that you keep it, or to put it more precisely, obey it. And then we're told that the time is near, which means the churches that originally received this work, this message, something was coming, and they needed to be encouraged to keep or to obey the word as it comes from Jesus and to continue in it, despite what is to come. And that is the message that we're about to get in this entire book. To hear the message from Jesus. To hear the message about Jesus. To recognize who he is. To live in the ways that he prescribes. And the ways that he has made a way for us to live. And to do so regardless of the circumstances. That will be the message for the churches to whom originally received this book and to those of us who receive it now. So we carry on. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So John has again identified himself, and all of a sudden I want you to catch something. Right out of the gate, we're given the primary literary genre. I know, no one wants to talk about literary genres. That's kind of boring. The primary literary genre of the book of Revelation Despite the fact that it is apocalyptic literature, and despite the fact that it is prophecy, it is first and foremost a letter. And not only a letter, but it contains within it a series of seven letters that we'll look at next week to seven churches. 
But John is writing to these seven churches the message that is from Jesus. And he reiterates again and again who Jesus is. That Jesus is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, the one who is and was and is to come. And then he says what Jesus did. He goes from what, who Jesus is to what Jesus has done. He loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And then he describes Jesus' coming. And the way that he describes this is the way that a military leader or a king or an emperor would be described to be coming. This language is very militaristic, and there's a reason for it. Because he's calling for the churches to live out the faith despite their circumstances. And their circumstances, as we're going to find out, are not great. They're facing hardship under the rule of the powers that be at the time of John's writing. And when you're facing persecution, when you're facing trouble from the world leaders and the world around you in a situation like this where you're trying to live out your faith, it can look and sound and feel like there is no hope. And the people that are in charge, the people that are in power, that are calling the shots are making life miserable even to death for those of us trying to live out our faith. But that would be a wrong-headed view because the language used to describe Jesus to the churches to whom this is being written to is language that reminds them who is in fact in power. And it is not the emperor. It is Jesus, the Lord. He is coming on the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Because they may be doing harm to the church at the behest of the world leaders, and they may be living good while the church is suffering. But when the true king comes in power and glory, everything will be flipped on its head. And the Lord reiterates, I am the Alpha and the Omega, for the record in Greek. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. And by the way, to say I am the Alpha and the Omega means that I was from the beginning, I will be for all of time, and even the time in between, I reign supreme. Who was and is and who is to come, the Almighty. This is who Jesus is, who is sending the message from John to the seven churches. Picking up at verse 9, John writes, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now I want to put a map on here, and I apologize, this is my fault. You might not be able to see it super well here. Uh, but... If you look at the bottom where this little red or orange line is here, depending on how your eyesight works, I can't tell if that's red or orange. Patmos is a little island on the outside of what is called Asia. And Asia is what we would call modern day Turkey. And if you see the line at, at every point, you'll see going around, which creates an almost circle that's not closed up are the seven churches in order. In fact, the order that we are given these seven churches in this writing here are in order from postal stops. You know, the 
They're not going to send the postman, you know, all over the place. He's just going to be able to go on his journey. It goes from, from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum to Thyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now, there's practical significance to the seven churches, and there's greater significance to the seven churches. You see, in the Bible and in the Old Testament, seven was the perfect number. It was an all-encompassing number. But these seven churches were all located at major points in this pretty major and influential area. And so from a practical standpoint, uh, this letter is circulating to these churches at, this, uh, at these large areas throughout Asia in order to get the message around to the body. But therein lies the larger purpose. While these letters or this letter is being sent to seven churches, it is meant for the church at large. What is good for the seven is good for all. And so the message, as we receive it in Revelation, to understand it well is to understand it as it would be understood and would have meant to the original seven churches to whom it was written to. And while it was not written to us, it is written for us. And the message still lives for us today. And so John goes on writing, as relayed to him, in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with, long, with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. Now John hears the voice of the one telling him to send this message, and he looks to see where this voice is coming from. But the first thing that we're told is not a description of the person speaking, but what the person speaking is standing amongst and amidst. Seven golden lampstands. Lampstands in the Old Testament age and in the temple period were important. Archaeological evidence suggests that lampstands of this variety were not common in everyday households. They tended to be relegated to important religious and ceremonial spaces like the temple. And in fact, when you see the seven lampstands, even the menorah comes to mind. We're going to be told in a moment that the lampstands represent the seven churches. But there's something important to recognize about these lampstands representing the churches. It means that the churches are sacred. They are important to the one standing amongst them. That's why the voice speaking is standing amongst the seven lampstands. Because Jesus is amongst his church. And then we're told that in the midst of the lampstands, there's one like a son of man. If you're familiar with the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, and then chapter 10, and even Ezekiel 1, this language will be familiar to you. Because the language that's used to describe the Lord Jesus who is speaking, the appearance, the hair that is white like wool, like snow, eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and a voice was like the roar of many waters. This description is the same used as the Ancient of Days pointing to the Lord God. Jesus is being described as God in the flesh. In the language of the book of Daniel. 
And not only that, not only that, but in the book of Daniel, the description of the Ancient of Days is used to describe God as being ruler over and against King Nebuchadnezzar. Because Daniel's experiencing the power and might of the captors and the folks that exiled the people of God. And yet, in the book of Daniel, the vision that's given is one where God is on the throne over and against all. And Jesus is being described in the same way. It's just there's a new power that the church is having to contend with. Carrying on, oh wait, one last thing I want to point out here. The clothing that Jesus is wearing. He is wearing a robe, a long robe with a golden sash around him. This is language that describes the kind of clothing that the high priest would wear. So Jesus is not only being seen by John as God in the flesh, but seen as the high priest the one to whom the churches can rely on. But carrying on to verse 17, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now earlier I mentioned the fact that the word angel carries with it a more generic term meaning messenger. And so whether these are angelic beings or simply messengers, misses the point. The point is, is that in this world, when a letter was written and circulated to churches, same as the letters of Paul and James and John and Peter, they were written and they were carried by messengers who would show up and read the contents of the message to the churches. Every time we read a letter, we have intercepted somebody else's mail. And we're reading the message that was first intended for those churches, but then intended for us too. And so uh, the messengers, the angels, are delivering the message to the seven lampstands or the seven churches. And why this message? Well, if you caught on as we've been reading through this chapter, and we've just read the entire first chapter here, uh, there are things that have already taken place, and there are things about to take place. And we were already told earlier that John is a sharer or partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. And it's really important to hang on to these words here. Because when I opened up my sermon and I told you about all the trepidation I had when I was first encountering the book of Revelation, or more importantly, the people in my life that talked about this book nonstop, you hear these words thrown out. You may have heard about millenniums. And if you get into someone that's really into theology, They'll talk about post-millennium and pre-millennium. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm an all-millennialist, which means I'm not really worried about it. Um, but you also hear people talk about the Great Tribulation, as if it's this thing that's going to come later. And they take that word, and then they take the other words from John where he says, there are the things that were and the things that are yet to come. And they, like my friend that I told you about before, they, they create a whole road map 
with all the dates and times and the length of years, thousand years, seven years here, and they plot them at different points, and they develop an entire theology, which, by the way, most of the argument that you would hear about Revelation in modern discourse really is about as old as about a hundred years, which in the grand scheme of the church means it's really new theology. And really new theology isn't as good as really old theology, by the way. We're more concerned with what Jesus and the early church said because we want to live and model what Jesus did and what was good for the apostles. But to bring us back to this word tribulation, it's a word that, again, has all sorts of meaning that is read into it, but at its core, it, it, it merely points to negative circumstances, oppression, and hardship. And if you caught what John said in that passage, he said he was a partner or sharer in the tribulation which your alarm bell should be going off and saying, this is not something far off. This is something John, who's writing this, has already experienced and is experiencing. And if you go read further, or go back and read further, you'll know that John is on the island of Patmos. And if you remember the map I showed you, it is on the outskirts. It is a place of exile. He is not on the mainland. He has been exiled to this island where he cannot escape. And he says he's been put there because of the testimony of Jesus, meaning as a person of faith, as an apostle, as a herald of the gospel, as a person that is wanting to bring the message that Jesus has been crucified and raised from the dead and has conquered sin and death, and to call the people, both the Jews and the Gentiles, to the faith to turn back to God. This message, which was in opposition to the religious and political structures of the day has got him put in exile on an island. He's already facing the tribulation. The church is already facing the tribulation, and it will continue. The emperor Nero that lived from the 30s, uh, or that reigned from the 30s to the 60s AD, was notorious for persecuting the church. Famously, once a fire broke out and he scapegoated the church as the people that were the cause of the fire, and he turned that into a persecution. And famously, do you want to know what he did to the scapegoated Christians? Well, since they started the fire, he lit them on fire for his little garden parties. I don't know that I'd be able to eat if I was invited to one of those parties, but... Now, one thing that happens when you study the history of the emperors and then the early churches, uh, it, it goes from there and, and more emperors come in. And, and a lot of scholars think that Revelation was written in the 90s AD. And at that time, the emperor Domitian was the emperor. And there's some debate on whether or not he actually carried out an at-large perse- persecution in the same way that Nero did. In fact, the early Christian writer Tertullian once said that uh, Domitian wanted to carry out a persecution like Nero, but ended up relenting and not doing so. Nevertheless, the climate was fiery for the church. Even if the persecution wasn't state-sponsored, the people living in the empire that had a problem with Christians made life difficult for the Christians living in the empire. And John is well aware that what he's already experienced is not only ongoing, but can come again in waves and in degrees of challenge perpetually. And when life gets hard, sometimes, sometimes, you want to quit. When life gets hard, sometimes you want to quit. You want to throw in the towel. And if you are living the faith that you are called to by Jesus, and you're facing the tribulation that has got John exiled on Patmos, and living your faith has to be done in secret, 
Because if it becomes more overt, you could end up like the other Christians, some of whom were your own family, friends that you knew. You may want to throw in the towel. And John is going to deliver a message from Jesus in this book that we're going to read. And he's already laid his case. And the case is this. No matter whether the persecution is state-sponsored or whether it's people in your day-to-day life picking on you and making life difficult, there is one who reigns supreme, who is above the rulers and powers and principalities, that has called you to abundant life and has died so that you can have it. And life may be difficult now, but he is with you as he promised in the Great Commission that he always will be to the end of the age. Matthew 28. Anyway, he promised that, and he is there. He is standing amongst the seven churches, reminding them that he is in power, reminding them that he reigns supreme, and ultimately reminding them that he will be in victory in the end. And that if you stick with him, you can share in the victory forever. And that's the book that we're going to look at over the next now five weeks because, well, we just did one. And it's a powerful, powerful book. And it's not powerful because of the ways in which we've interpreted it or the ways that we've been afraid to read it or afraid to talk about it. But it's powerful because of the truth that it tells about Jesus and the truth that it tells about us as his church. And that's why I want us to remember this one thing from this chapter. Hope thrives where Jesus abides. Hope thrives where Jesus abides. We do not live in first century Rome. But I promise you that there are and have been powers and principalities. And they may not always appear antagonistic. But I will tell you that to live out the faith that Jesus calls us to will always be hard. Whether it'll put you at odds with your coworkers, your friends, your family, the powers that be, it will always be difficult. It may even put you at odds with yourself. Because you may not want to live in the way Jesus calls you to live. You may want to do some other thing or some other set of things. And Jesus is going to say something about that in the churches, or to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. But I want us to remember this point throughout this entire read through Revelation, that hope thrives where Christ abides because he is always in power. He is always present. And he always provides us hope amongst the hardship, just like he did to the seven churches. Even when they were getting off the mark, even when they lost their first love, even when they got complacent, even when they thought they could straddle the fence. Jesus says something about spitting you out for being lukewarm. We'll see that. Even then, even in all of its frailty and failures, Jesus loves the church, and we are his body. And where he is, there is hope. And he reigns supreme. So we need not fear. Hope thrives where Christ abides. I hope that when you came in that you took a communion packet and you brought it with you. And if you didn't, feel free to get one. We take communion each week because on the Lord's day, as John said, by the way, I don't know if you caught that, he says that Jesus started speaking to him on the Lord's day. That's code for Sunday. (laughs) 
Resurrection Sunday. He was at church on the island of Patmos, fun times. Jesus told his disciples to take and do this in remembrance of him. And one of the beautiful things about the crucifixion of Jesus, a rather ugly thing, and yet beautiful nonetheless, is that Jesus was crucified by the Roman powers that were persecuting the church, that were persecuting people like John. And they were really good at crucifixion. They were really good at torture. They were really good at making a show of it so that the people that lived under their power would stay in line and not deviate so that they continue, could continue to rule and have their version of peace in the land. And for crucified people, that normally was a sign that you lost. But the great irony, as John shares in the Gospel of John, when he talks about Jesus saying that he will be exalted, is that the Romans thought they were putting an end to the message of Jesus, to his kingship. Pontius Pilate famously says, are you, famously says, are you a king? Sneering at him like that. But in reality, when they exalted him on the cross, they weren't defeating him. They were putting him in power high above all else. When Jesus laid down his life, he proved once and for all that he is in fact king. So when we take communion and we remember his crucifixion, we not only remember what Jesus told us to way back when he told his disciples to take and remember and of him, but we actually remember the truth that John is articulating in Revelation, that he is Lord and Savior and in dominion over all. Even when it didn't look like he was. And there are plenty of times in our lives where it doesn't look like he is. And it doesn't feel like we are in a good spot. But when we take communion, we proclaim that he is Lord and Savior. Right along with his first disciples. So I'm going to invite you to take a moment to contemplate the power and dominion of Jesus as told through the story of his crucifixion and his resurrection. And after you've taken a moment to contemplate, we will take communion together as one church family. drink from this cup. This is his blood which is poured out for us. Please pray with me. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you are ruler of all and that as your son Jesus promised to his earliest disciples that he is with us for all time the end of the age and by the power of your Holy Spirit and we thank you for this wonderful message that no matter our circumstances that you are with, 
with us, to help us live out the faith that you've called us to. To continue walking the walk of faith, bearing the fruit of the Spirit by your power. And I pray, God, that as we study this wonderful book, this message from John delivered to him by Jesus, sent to the churches, that as we cut through the confusion and and the things that can trip us up or can sidetrack us, that we will stay grounded in the message. The message that you are with us, that we can abide in you because you are with us. That we can cling to you and rely on you. And that no matter uh, the fate or the outcome that we face in the here and now, that we know that we get to share in your victory in the end. And you are victorious. We thank you for being so good to us, for loving us so much that you sent your only son. And we pray these things in his name.